from that. They can start now. Okay. Well, oh, no. Shall I be starting right now or shall I wait until you? No, wait. we'll just wait. So we'll wait for the attendees to join. And then once the attendees have joined, I'll give you the introduction and then we'll start. Okay. She's too used to just talking to herself at all times. So. So the attendees are still going up, so we'll just give it another um, 30 seconds for the attendees to come in before we start. Matt. <laughs> Was it me? Yeah. <laughs> you joined with the microphone on, it's fine, it's stopped now. Cool. Um, so I think we'll get started so I can see the attendees are coming in. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for joining uh, and we're pleased to welcome Mariana Allison. Um, you might know, you might recognize the surname. So Mariana is Matt's wife and Mariana is going to share her experiences of going through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD for short, which is one of the options uh, for having children without the risk of passing on um, the HG expanded gene. And we're about to hear of, of some of the challenges, uh, but also some of some of the um, obviously positives as well. So this is a 30 minute session and there'll be around 10 minutes for questions at the end. So please write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll get to those at the end. I'll hand over to Mariana. Hello everyone. It's lovely to speak to you all today but I can't see you unfortunately. I will be speaking about IVF PGD experience in our family. The IVF itself is really tough. IVF PGD may be tougher, but it's definitely rewarding, at least in our case, thankfully. Uh, some of you may already know that I've got the Huntington's disease background as well. As in this picture, you can see me when I was two year old and my dad, who later was diagnosed with Huntington's disease. And unfortunately, as he was progressing, he was feeling worse, he was looking worse. And it was a really difficult experience for us to go through. Um, especially when you can see this change when you're becoming the care of your dad, of your parent. Um, as some of you were talking about today, all these feelings, all these emotions, the whole experience you have to go through when you're looking after your loved one. It's really, really not easy, especially when you're facing the genetic risk and you're thinking that it may be me in the future. So that definitely wasn't easy, but eventually I decided to go for the genetic test and I got tested negative, meaning I don't have the mutated gene, which gave me lots of strength to start being active in Huntington's disease community in Poland to start with. Um, Adam Polish, if you can hear from my accent, and after being active in, in Poland, I started to travel and volunteer for Huntington's disease cause, joining the EHDN working group and then being part of HDO. At one of the meetings, I met Matt and I met lots of other lovely, lovely friends and were in touch till now. It's Marina and Laura in the picture as well as Matt and myself. And when you're being active and you think that you can change people's lives, you can make some good impact on their lives and help yourself as well in the same time, uh, we easily, as it happened, fell in love with Matt. But when, even before I met him in person, I knew that he was tested positive for Huntington's disease. So that really wasn't the easy choice to join this relationship. 
because I knew that I'm HD3 and I, I've got such a great chance of having HD3 life in the future. No problems with having healthy children, no life problems related to Huntington's later on. But you can't tell your heart what to feel. So we started to date and we started to continue the relationship, taking that really seriously from the beginning. Um, we got married nearly seven years ago now. And we had my dad's blessing that me and my dad on our wedding day, when he stood up from his wheelchair to give us a hug when we were leaving the church after the ceremony. And naturally, although the discussion started even before, we started to think about having children in the future, which we knew it wouldn't be the easy choice what to do, how to approach it. And as you probably know, there is lots of options for the Huntington's disease families to get pregnant. Um, the easiest one is just having children naturally, they'll get pregnant, not get tested, and hope for the best in the future. Science is um, developing and hopefully the treatment will be available soon. We all are hoping for that so, so, so much. Um, but we didn't want this option because we knew how tough it is for a young person, both of us, we both knew, uh, to go through the testing process, to live in unknown being a care for your affected parent. So we didn't want to choose that option. And there is an option of prenatal testing, exclusion testing. IVFPGD was the option which we went for. We didn't want to go for external embryo donation, but we wanted to have our biological children. That's just our choice in here. And we knew that adoption might be very difficult for the families with Huntington's disease already. Um, None of these choices, whichever we would make, would be easy because lots of them had huge disadvantages. I think more for myself than for Matt. Um, if it was the prenatal testing we went for, that would be a very long waiting time, like 12, maybe 13 weeks to do the prenatal test and the baby would be already developing. And that's a 50% chance of a very late termination, which I don't know whether I would be able to go through. So we thought that the better option for us would be IVF, even though it's a very challenging process. Um, and it's not such a high success rate related to IVF with CBD. We thought that's a better option for us. But I do respect any couple's choices because at the end of the day, you've got great chance to have a HD3 baby and that's what we all really, really want. Um, I don't know whether all of you know how the IVF process is looking like. So to start with, there is lots of um, injection mainly as the treatment for uh, increasing the number of eggs getting mature uh, in female ovaries. And the injections are given to your belly, your tummy. They are not very painful, but I know some women may have the issue with injecting themselves. In our case, Matt wanted to be really involved into the treatment. So he was giving me the, <clears throat> the evening injections because in the morning that was too early for him to get up and inject me. So the morning ones were mine, but the evening ones were very much involved into it. Um, and then when you were developing your eggs on a day when the egg retrieval is happening, um, partner gives his sperm sample and the eggs are getting fertilized. In a normal process, after eggs are getting fertilized, the embryos are developing, they are inserted to female womb and they are hoping for the best to have a baby. In our case, at the stage where, uh, where the embryos are developing, the testing process is taking place, which is added challenge on already challenging IVF process. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens when you've got your egg in the first picture um, getting fertilized, the zygote is becoming out of it and it keeps dividing. 
to two cell stage, four cell stage, eight cell stage, marula and blastocyst. At the usually eight cell stage or marula or blastocyst, the biopsy is happening. So they take a little tiny, tiny, tiny cell uh, from inside of blastocyst to get it tested for the HD mutation. Obviously the testing takes time, it's your waiting time, and the little challenge related to this process is that not all embryo will be making that so that far to get tested because they are only developing in the artificial environment. Hence, they are not as likely uh, to develop as in the natural female environment, unfortunately. So when you probably were hearing from lots of women nowadays going through fertility treatment, how difficult it is, when you add this PGD process, this um, <clears throat> prenatal um, genetic diagnosis, pre-implantation, even before inserting that to the womb now, process, it's even much, much, much tougher with lots of frustration, anxiety, um, horrible waiting time to get the answers about your embryos, how they are developing, and what, uh, what results they've got at the end, whether they are okay to be inserted to your womb or not. Um, the added thing on the PGD process in Huntington's disease case is that normally for fertility treatment, the couples who can't naturally conceive, uh, they just join the process and that goes smoothly. In PGD, the little added problem is that you have to switch from the hormonal contraception because you don't want to get pregnant naturally if you don't want it to go through the prenatal testing and so on. You have to switch to the mechanical methods like condoms. And then the rest of the process looks similar to IVF. So you've got the consultations and several tests for both partners to make sure that you both are healthy and okay to have children. Um, otherwise, you go through the ovarian stimulation, as I explained. So you keep giving these injections. You've got the monitoring scans every other day, usually. And when your eggs are ready, you go for the egg retrieval process. They retrieve as many eggs as they can, as, as suitable for fertilization, and they try to match it with the suitable sperm. Uh, and you're hoping for the best that your embryos will be developing enough to be mature enough for having biopsy to get them tested. And then you just wait for the results which embryos are affected by Huntington's and which are not. The little challenge related to that is that the numbers are hugely decreasing because you may have as many as even 15 to maybe 30 eggs retrieved in the process, but only some of them will get fertilized, so that may halve your numbers. And then not all of them will develop into the stage of biopsy process. Um, that may halve it again or may decrease it even more than that. After biopsy, obviously, you've got 50% chance, chance that that could be a healthy embryo or affected with Huntington's embryo. So you may end up with not many suitable embryos, but as long as you've got the one, that's all what, what matters because you really, really only need one. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have more embryos, um, more suitable embryos, um, they freeze the excess embryos in suitable time, the embryo transfer happens, and you're just waiting for this pregnancy test day, hoping that it will be positive, and hoping that you will be able to announce your happy pregnancy. I really like this picture. I don't have a similar one with Joey, so it's not him in the picture, um, but the picture of a little baby with lots of injections, which parents are so, motivated and committed to this pregnancy and with a little help of science they can go through that even though it's not the easy process not uh, not the painless process and emotionally difficult as well you can get there and we were one of this lucky couple we that a picture taken on a day when we had the phone call from the hospital our blood test results 
about the positive pregnancy test from the blood. So that was too early to take the traditional pregnancy test. And they just called us saying that there is a huge chance that I may already be pregnant. And our friends happened to be with us and took this picture for us, which is bringing loads of lovely memories. And that really, really was a challenging process because that was our second IVF cycle. And after a good start of the cycle and having loads of eggs, loads of eggs fertilized, we ended up with only one and only suitable embryo to get transferred to me. And the suitable embryo happened to be Joey. So we were very, very lucky in the whole process. Um, but we've gone through all the hurdles and complications of IVF. We thankfully, thankfully to NHS, the British health system didn't have to pay for the process. So a huge, huge problem came off of our list, which was very, very lucky. But we had some other unexpected health issues, um, as I had PCOS, so it was much more difficult to stimulate me to get enough eggs um, suitable for fertilizing. Uh, it's a challenging process in terms of even traveling to the clinic, taking time off work, which I was finding um, really difficult that you have to keep asking uh, whoever is responsible for creating your rota at work. Uh, I had to be asking about time off, even though they were really supportive and really helpful. I was feeling that I'm asking for too much, that it's creating more problems in my workplace when I have to ask for more and more and more time off. Um, I know that lots of people are struggling with um, colleague support. My colleagues were absolutely amazing throughout the whole process. They were really supportive, really helpful. And I don't know what I would do if I couldn't share this information with them that we're going through such a difficult time in our lives right now. Um, so we are quite lucky in that um, aspect. But I know that in some workplaces, women don't want to share that they are going through the fertility treatment, not even going into a detail of PGD part of the process. Um, you can face, especially with my Polish background, Polish Catholic background, you can face people who are against IVF methods to start with, and they will be telling you, why do you feel that you've got the right to choose the healthy embryos? Why do you not let God decide? Why do you not let the nature decide? And it may be a huge issue for lots of women who, at the time of the process, are much more sensitive to listen to all that comment. Um, IVF treatment has lots of um, side effects related to that as well. So there is a high risk of hormonal overstimulation, which we were going through as well, unfortunately. So it was a high risk pregnancy. Um, I had to have lots of time work, uh, lots of time of work. At the beginning of the pregnancy, I think between like week nine and week 17 or something like that. It was a long time when lots of water was um, in my belly and we weren't sure how the pregnancy is going to go. Uh, there is a high risk of premature delivery of IVF pregnancies. But as long as you get pregnant and you're under a close supervision of the doctor, fingers crossed, everything will be going all right. So um, at halfway through the pregnancy, we were feeling safe enough to announce the pregnancy to our friends and sort of family. The closest family knew at the very beginning, but we were happy to spread the news just after half of the pregnancy when we knew it's a healthy boy uh, coming to the world. <clears throat> and it was a really, really nice time. I was able to be working, but was having a little challenge of creating the baby room in the house. And he actually did very, very well. The room doesn't look the same anymore because Joe is a crazy baby and he keeps destroying everything right now. And nearly four years ago, we had our little boy with us, which was a, the most amazing moment. And that was like the miracle which we were waiting for for the whole life. And it was amazing to have him with us after all what we're going through the process. 
Um, when Joe was three months old, we managed to go to Poland for the first time to introduce him to my dad. That was my dad's first grandson. And he was very happy. He was always paying so much attention, even though he had advanced KPD at, at, the mo at, at that moment. He always was prioritizing Joey when I was saying that, oh, that sorry, I can't feed you right now because I need to feed Joey. He was saying, oh, don't worry, Joey's first, I can wait. And he never, ever was able to wait otherwise. It was only for Joey. And that was an amazing time we spent together. We were going as often as we could when I was off on maternity leave. And I was so happy they can have this connection. Unfortunately, when Joey was um, just over a year old, uh, my dad passed away, but I'm so happy they were able to have this time together. Um, there is just a few last tips if you decide to go through the IVF journey. Um, just some healthy lifestyle advice, really, from my experience. So it's important to eat healthy before the process and throughout the process, because as they say, it all starts from the egg. And as long as your eggs are good quality, there is a good chance the process will be going better. With the PCOS, which I was going through, it wasn't that easy because there was lots of eggs being produced, but unfortunately, lots of them were not the best quality. But we got there in the end with our one lucky embryo, one strong embryo. Uh, you have to stay fit. I don't know whether we are, but you should in theory. That's Matt trying to exercise. You have to sleep well, look after your well being as well. Uh, you have to stay positive and have the positive approach. The problem with the positive approach is you want to stay as positive as you can and hope for the best in the process. But at the same time, you have to be aware um, that it may not be successful and you don't want to be hugely let down because after the first failed IVF, it was very difficult to deal with the failed cycle. So we have to find this right balance. Um, we had this is a family picture, Matty's family picture. Um, the lady in the blue t-shirt is his auntie Leslie, who was symptomatic at the time of taking this picture. But she's always been very positive, very hopeful for us, wanting the best for all of us. And actually, thanks to her DNA, we managed to go through the PGD process because we needed some DNA of the affected with Huntington's family member, as much as that hasn't been with us at the time. And she shared her um, saliva swap, whatever it's called, with DNA sample. And thanks to her, we we're able to go through this process and have Joey at the end. And she really, really loved him as well. She's not with us anymore, but she was amazing with Joey. She was amazing with us as well. Um, you have to really have a good strong relationship to support each other during the IVF journey because it really may be scary. I just used our um, picture from our honeymoon uh, with some, Joey says right now, there are crocodiles because he, his pronunciation is not the best, but that sounds really cute when he says that. But as scary as they are, the IVF process may be scary at times as well, but may be amazing as well. So you have to believe in science, you have to believe in research as well. This is Professor Tabriti here, whom we love very much and respect her a lot as well. And you just have to hope for a little miracle for yourself as well. Wishing all of you who are interested in that process lots of luck and lots of strength. And please, 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 if you ever had any questions or anything what I could help with, I'm more than happy to help you. That's that's all for now, but I'm open for any questions or whatever you need. Oh, Mariana, thank you so much. That was so beautiful and um, all the pictures and that as well. I'm sure everyone agree they were they were really beautiful. Thank you. So we do have um, a few questions that I'll read out. And if you've got any more questions, guys, please write them in the Q&A box. So the first one is from Kathy, who says, how did you feel during the hormone treatment? I was very lucky. I didn't have many side effects. I was very well motivated knowing that that's our main option to get, pre to get pregnant. 
eventually, but I was very lucky. I don't think maybe Matt should answer to that question. I don't think I was a totally crazy person on the treatment, not much more than normal anyway. Um, so yeah, I was quite lucky. It didn't happen to me that not as much as the pregnancy eventually, and I had a lot of side effects with the water getting in my tummy and at the even before the official pregnancy test, I had so much water in my tummy that I already looked like seven months pregnant or so. But it was due to the hormonal changes in pregnancy rather than treatment itself during the treatment. Okay, then that makes sense. And then um, a question from um, someone else has said, um, how many eggs are extracted at one treatment? And then this person says, uh, she's she's a woman and she's the one who's tested positive and she's wondering if that makes a difference in the process depending on the gender of the partner who's at risk. It doesn't make any difference because um, the test is happening at the embryo stage so you need egg and sperm connected and egg fertilized by sperm to get it tested so it doesn't make any difference at all. I think some doctors or scientists should answer how the um, um, process affects you as a woman when you're being put to sleep for egg retrieval. Because sometimes they say when um, when you're put to sleep for any sort of surgery, sometimes I'm, that may trigger the Huntington symptoms. But I don't know the evidence for that, so I can't really speak about it. But otherwise, as long as you don't have the polycystic ovary syndrome, for example, uh, they retrieve as many eggs as they are mature. I think the first time we we're going through the process that was only six eggs, but the second time that probably was about 15 eggs, but then not all of them were fertilized. I think only 12 of them were fertilized and eight of them were growing. And out of this eight, there was the only strong, healthy embryo. So the numbers are really decreasing, but as long as at the very end you've got the one, that's all what you need. No, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. Because I think um obviously with you saying you're affected by polycystic ovary syndrome, so PCOS, um, you know, one in ten women are affected by that. So I think that's probably um there may well be women or people on the call with with partners who um they're looking at PGD and, and also are affected by uh, polycystic ovary syndrome as well. So that's good to hear to hear your views on that. Other solutions for that. So as long as you trust your consultant, fingers crossed for you. Yeah. Um, so two, a few more questions. So how many rounds of IVF can you have on the NHS? So that's um, for everyone else attending, that's the health system in the UK. I uh, think in UK though, it really depends on the postcode yeah. a bit because I don't know whether it's the same in every single region and CDL um, in the UK. For us, it was three attempts and each attempt is um, sort of finished with the egg retrieval, I believe. Right. Even mm -hmm. if you've got more embryos, it still is counted within one attempt. But the first time we had only one embryo and the second time we only had one embryo as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you only are entitled to three attempts if you don't have any other children and your BMI is normal, you're not a smoker and you're within the certain age group. The important thing is if you get pregnant, let's say during your first cycle, you don't have any more attempts because you already have your baby then. So if you want to go through the process again, you have to pay privately. Mm -hmm. No, that's good attempts, we use two of them. And um, near me in Liverpool, for example, it's two rounds. Um, but I know some places in Manchester that might only be one, or sometimes some local authorities are saying none. Um, yeah, it's not, so it's it does depend. Which is very unfair, isn't it? You may, I don't know, you may consider changing your life completely and move to the area where it's free of charge because otherwise yeah. the process would cost for us, I think, about seven, eight, maybe a bit more than that, thousand pounds. It's a huge mm -hmm. amount of money. Um, so two more questions and hopefully we'll have time to get through these two last questions. So um, one question is, do you know how accurate the PGT, uh, PGD testing is and is it guaranteed? So I think 
this person's referring to um, ruling out the expanded Huntington's gene rather than IVF because IVF's only got what a 30 percent ish chance of working as it but um, I'll leave it over to you on the um, how accurate is the PGD part. I think they were saying that the process that it's one or two percent chance that the genetic test result wouldn't be accurate. Okay. So it's not a high risk. If you want a backup, you can always go through prenatal testing when you're already pregnant. But prenatal testing may increase the risk of miscarriage in already high risk pregnancy and we decided not to go for it. But you can have like a double check that way. Um, I'm just going to read out this point because I might have misspoke with some areas of Manchester. So um, uh, I can't read the full name. I think it's Harriet has said she works in genetics in Manchester in the UK and three cycles are funded on the NHS within the eligibility criteria. So that's great. That's, that's fantastic news. So yeah, check yeah. your... It's a huge, huge help. I always say that I'm, I'm, I work in the pharmacy and whenever people complain about the NHS or the system whatsoever, I always say how grateful I am because our son, even before he was born, he was already worth like, I don't know, 18,000 pounds or so. Apart from the fact that he's our miracle and treasure and he's priceless, but it's a huge help from NHS and that's amazing. No, definitely. And on the last um, question um, that I've got here is, are there any age limits to PGD? I think I was reading actually before this um, talk today that women, I think it was on HD Bath, they were saying that women um, 40 and over, they hardly have any chance to succeed with PGD IVF. Because in a way, you've got a lower chance to get pregnant with PGD IVF as you're reducing the amount of suitable embryos because of the genetic testing. So not all of them are suitable. In normal idea, when they start the implantation, uh, insertion of the embryos to your womb on a day two or three, you've got a much higher chance in a way to get pregnant than on a day five when the embryos don't, don't even make it to day five. And then they are getting tested and only let's say half of them at 50% chance are healthy and suitable. So I think based on that, the earlier the better. No, definitely. Um... So I think um, I think the advice would be as well to people asking is to speak with your um, in the UK be I guess your GP or to speak with your local uh, doctor and then you can find out whatever country you're in what the um, cost or if, it, if you can have some uh, attempts for free what the um, kind of you can find out more from them. Yeah, I agree. No, that's great. And again, thank you, Harriet, for, for clarifying that point. Um, it, I think it varies for, for every every city. So it's yeah, it's best to check with your doctor. So um, thank you so much, Mariana, for, for your talk. Um, you. We now have, I think, a 15, yeah, we have a 15 minute break um, now. And that's followed by um, having children on track one. Um, and on track two, we have Nacho sharing his journey with Factor H in South America. Um, but yeah, I guess following on from this session, uh, the options for having children on, on track one will, will be of interest as well. So thank you again, Mariana, and thank you all thank for, you for your much. questions and comments. Thank you. And have, have a great break before you go into your next session. Thanks. Bye. Bye.